I would like to introduce uh, Humphrey Hawksley, who will be the uh, moderator today. He's a distinguished uh, foreign correspondent uh, with the BBC for many years. He opened the BBC Bureau uh, in the mid 90s in Beijing and has much experience of, of this area of Asia. He's uh, now a, a very successful author and a commentator and broadcaster. And uh, particularly he's written about uh, his nonfiction books that have focused on this area, uh, Asian waters and also the South China Sea and uh, the Korean Peninsula tension issues. And uh, we're very grateful that he uh, agreed to uh, moderate today. And over to you, over to you, Humphrey. Robin, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind welcome. And it's a privilege to be here today with such a group of experts to discuss transition to peace on the Korean Peninsula, what confidence building measures are necessary and who can guide the process? Is it possible to create trust between North and South Korea, and particularly in today's tense geopolitical climate between their powerful allies, the United States and China? Just as a recap, the Korean Peninsula was carved up between the US and the Soviet Union in 1945 after the Second World War. Then came the Korean War, 1950 to 53, a stalemate, and it remained divided. The two countries joined the United Nations as, in, as, as separate nations in 1991, and then two years later, South Korea elected its full, its first civilian president in 1993, becoming a, a democracy. The North hunkered down into a dynastic dictatorship. In the mid 90s, it came to the brink of war with America. There was a deal, the deal was torn up. It went on to develop nuclear weapons. There was a brief love-in between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, little rocket man, but today it seems that we've slid back with the North conducting two ballistic missile tests this week, directly challenging the Biden presidency, which described it as business as usual. Our closing remarks, summing up this, is going to be from Dr. Katsumi Utsaka, Universal Peace Federation's Europe and Middle East Chairman. And to discuss all this and more, we have Keith Bennett, Aidan Foster Carter, Mike Chinoy, my journalist colleague on North Korea in the 1990s, and Jenny Town, who I'm going to start ask to start. Jenny is a senior fellow at the Stimson Center and the director of the 38 North program, which provides policy and technical analysis on North Korea. Look it up and follow it if you want deep detail. And just tangentially, Worth magazine named Jenny last year as a, as a groundbreaker 2020, one of the 50 women changing the world. So Jenny, please bring us up to date on the US view of the Korean Peninsula and any other insight you might have. Great, thanks Humphrey. And thanks to the Universal Peace Federation for having me here today. I'm really honored to be on this distinguished panel and I do wish we could be in person instead. Um, so Humphrey did ask me to do sort of an overview of the roller coaster that has been USDPRK relations over the past administration and where that leaves us today in about five to seven minutes. Um, <laughs> it's a tall order, <laughs> but I talk fast. So let me lay out some broad strokes and key milestones here to put this all in perspective. Um, in 2017, USDPRK relations didn't start out badly. Talks were initiated soon after Trump took office and things were going well at first. Um, visas were about to be approved for a North Korean delegation to come to New York for a track 1.5 meeting. And the mood around that meeting was quite positive. Um, but before those visas were issued, North Korea tested a missile in February of that year, and which was quickly followed by the assassination of Kim Jong-nam in Kuala Lumpur. That really soured the mood. <laughs> Um, and from there, with the meeting canceled and tensions rising, North Korea then really ramped up its missile testing to levels similar to what we saw in 2016, but with progressively bigger and more consequential systems. And so the big turning point was really in July of that year when North Korea tested its first ICBM, a technology that many experts had underestimated its ability to achieve. 
This made a huge impression on the American public. Um, it was really the first time Americans saw and internalized North Korea as a threat to us, not just to the region. Um, and you had a level of panic in the US media and as experts fixated on the technology side of the story and not the context of how ICBM capability fit into a broader strategy. So you had local papers, especially on the West Coast, writing alarmist stories about how North Korean missiles could be coming at us any day now and reviving even old civil defense training protocols in some areas. The US government response didn't help. <laughs> it wasn't calming and assuring that this was a threat that could be deterred. Instead, they engaged in their own brinkmanship of fire and fury against the North. And I think we all remember how it escalated from there until by the end of the year, North Korea had tested a hydrogen bomb and an even bigger ICBM, thus declaring its state nuclear force complete and enabling Kim Jong-un to claim victory in achieving one half of his state policy of Pyongyang or this dual development of its economy and nuclear deterrent. It also enabled Kim, though, to then in 2018, turn efforts towards the economy and work on repairing the relations it needed to facilitate greater economic development in North Korea. And South Korea opened that door for them. They first tied to North Korea's participation in the Pyeongchang Olympics, with those talks seamlessly transitioning into a larger dialogue on peace and security issues. And so this thaw in inter-Korean relations and Trump's own unpredictability eventually led to a series of summits in 2018 between Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping, Moon Jae-in, and Trump. So in terms of USDPRK relations from there, you know, the Singapore summit produced a joint statement that essentially set an agenda to to be worked out, giving equal priority to peace building, normalization of relations, as well as working towards denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Um, however, subsequent working level meetings and negotiations got hung up over denuclearization. Where to start? How much was enough as a first step? Or do we just go through the whole program in one swoop? Um, but And then what were equitable reciprocal actions? And as we all know, efforts to even get a first phase agreement failed accordingly. So where does this leave us? And where does this leave the Biden administration? Um, while Kim Jong-un did portray the summit in a very positive light in the Eighth Party Congress this January, he also expressed a declining belief that a different relationship with the US is actually possible, and thus is seemingly in no rush to resume negotiations. But he did leave the door to diplomacy essentially unlocked, but put the act of opening that door on the US and South Korea. This is a huge challenge for the US in the current political climate, as it means the US will likely have to take some kind of unilateral actions that signal different outcomes are possible. This could be something like lifting the travel ban on US citizens traveling to North Korea or removing obstacles for US NGOs to provide humanitarian assistance and related equipment to North Korea. But something tangible that shows that the relationship is not static and can evolve. Um, we've seen this reinforced already in Chase and He's recent statement explaining why there's been no response from the North Korean side to early US overtures. On the other hand, maintaining the status quo is not a sustainable option in the long run, as it means that North, that North Korea's WMD capabilities continue to grow. And as we've seen, their conventional capabilities are improving as well. So this increases the threat they pose to the region, to the US, and to US extended deterrence, as we've already seen um, with increased debate in South Korea about whether it's time for them to go nuclear to match North Korea's capabilities. So another challenge we'll face in trying to gain traction with the North Koreans is that the priorities for the talks will have to be broader than just denuclearization, as agreed to in the joint statement, the Singapore joint statement. But so far, public statements from the Biden administration have focused heavily on the nuclear issue, raising concerns that will fall back on this unproductive agenda. Um, but if we can get back to talks, there is another looming issue, and that is, in previous talks, Kim Jong-un was an active negotiator, 
limiting the scope of what could be achieved in working level meetings. And I think it's unlikely that he'll be willing to delegate this authority back down the chain. Um, but of course, waiting for a summit to actually negotiate that aspect of, uh, of, the, prop of the agreement is really a risky proposition. And neither side wants to repeat what happened in Hanoi with both sides walking away from the summit empty handed. So Biden's team will have to think creatively about how to factor in ways to communicate with Kim on certain issues outside the constraints of high profile summits to make sure that if and when they do meet in person, it will be to mutual benefit and gain and not a big gamble like we've seen before. Um, so it's good that the Biden administration is taking time to conduct a policy review as there's numerous challenges, some very new, um, that the administration faces in trying to make progress in USDPRK relations. Thank you. Jenny, uh, thank you very much for that. But before we move on, um, I seem to remember, I think, think is that President Obama, when he handed over to Trump, left in that letter in the top drawer in the Oval Office, uh, saying that the Korean Peninsula should be number one on the foreign policy agenda. Now, I don't know. I can't remember if if uh, Donald Trump left a note for Joe Biden, but where would you put it in the, the current focus on the Indo-Pacific and the boosting it up with Kurt Campbell's appointment in the, in, in the National Security Council and that, where would you put it on the importance? And getting back to our title, uh, is there a chance for any initiative that you sort of touched on of a transition to peace on the Korean Peninsula? Well, I, I think in terms of the Biden priorities and the Biden foreign policy priorities, we have seen that Asia is a very high pri priority for him with Blinken and Austin taking the trip to Asia first. Yeah. Um, but I, I think a lot of that policy is China, the alliances, and then North Korea. Mm. Um, and I, I think, you know, the North Koreans have been relatively quiet over the past few months um, at the end of the Trump administration, sort of waiting him out. And now even at the beginning of the Biden administration, we're just starting to see activity pick back up. So I think the, the chances for peace um, really are dependent on either the US or South Korea, one being able to move forward with, like I said, some unilateral actions that show that different outcomes are possible if we can get back to the table. Um, but it's very difficult to do in an environment where North Korea is being provocative or is being aggressive in their behavior. So a lot of it will really depend on, on both the administration's decision on the North Korea policy review, but also on North Korea's behavior as well. And, and, the, and the ballistic missile tests that, that, that happened yesterday or, or the day before, that's the message, is it, from, from Kim Jong-un saying, hey, we're still around, uh, pay attention to us? <laughs> I think it's less of a message than people are making it out to be. Um, we just did the U.S. ROC joint military exercises. It is very common um, in the past for the North Koreans to do these kinds of short-range ballistic missile tests around the time of the exercises as sort of a tit for tat protest. Um, so in terms of like, are they trying to test the administration? If they are, it's not a very strong test. <laughs> um, and I think it's much more just sort of a signal that North Korea is resuming business as usual. Yeah, that, which, which is what they said. Jenny, thank you very much. Stay around for the question and answers because sure. they're already coming in. And now we're going to move to Keith Bennett, who is a longtime consultant on North Korea. He knows the officials and the government there very well and has twice been awarded the Friendship Order of the DPRK by the founding president, Kim Il-sung. He's also deputy chairman of the Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il Foundation. So there's really no better person around to give us a North Korean perspective on what they want to achieve and what's happening there. So Keith, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Humphrey. Thank you, Robin. Uh, one of the issues that's raised in the publicity for uh, today's meeting is the question of a US or South Korean president possibly withdrawing from a prior agreement made by a previous administration. This is a pertinent issue. Uh, we've seen it with the demise of the earlier sunshine policy when a liberal administration gave way to a conservative one in Seoul. 
And we certainly saw relevant examples with the Trump administration, like the withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal or the Paris Climate Change Accord or the UN World Health Organization. And of course, we've seen it previously in the history of US relations with the DPRK. Uh, the October 1994 Agreed Framework Agreement uh, entered into by President Clinton, which uh, Humphrey referenced in his opening remarks, suffered delays and prevarication only to be repudiated and replaced by axis of evil rhetoric by President George W. Bush. So historically, that fear has mostly been associated with the possible actions by a Republican incumbent regarding the work of his Democrat predecessor. But today, we may face the situation of the overturn of a standpoint of actions, if not an actual deal, of a Republican predecessor by his Democrat successor. There was, of course, no actual deal concluded by the US and the DPRK as a result of the unprecedented meetings between President Trump and Kim, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un in Singapore, Hanoi, and Panmunjom. Now, that may have been a product of Trump's lack of diplomatic experience or his somewhat inflated view of his own deal-making abilities. But more especially, it seems clear to me that it resulted from the obstruction and perhaps outright wrecking of his efforts by key members of his own team at the time, uh, such as John Bolton. Be that as it may, the Democrats attacked these meetings at the time and during the presidential election campaign. President Biden has presented the idea of a possible meeting with Kim Jong-un as some sort of unilateral favor to be possibly bestowed by the US. And needless to say, this interpretation is not one that is shared in Pyongyang. And of course, the current US president has also described Kim Jong-un as a thug, um, but he's made quite colorful references to um, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping as well, of course. President Biden has, however, not completely ruled out the possibility of a meeting with Kim Jong-un, but he has said that such a meeting can only be contemplated once the DPRK has taken steps to disarm. To me, this rather overlooks the fact that negotiations are generally held with a view to reaching agreements, not after agreements have been reached. So I think it's against this background that we should look at the DPRK's attitude towards the discrete approaches made by the Biden administration to the DPRK through a number of channels, including the well-established UN channel in New York and via an unnamed third country. And the DPRK has set out its current position in two statements from what I've dubbed two leading ladies in DPRK diplomacy. The first, as many of you know, was issued on March 16 by Kim Yo-jong, the younger sister of Kim Jong-un. And whilst most Western commentary focused mainly on Ms. Kim's remarks regarding the US, these actually accounted for just two short sentences towards the end of her quite lengthy statement, which focused overwhelmingly on the, on the question of relations with South Korea. But her admonition that the Biden administration had, quote, better refrain from causing a stink at its first step clearly had the sole visit of Secretary of State Blinken and Defence Secretary Austin in mind. Now, this statement was followed two days later, on March 18th, by one from Che Sun Hui, the first Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, which did explicitly focus on the US. Confirming those various approaches, she stated, we have already declared our stand that no DPRK US contact and dialogue of any kind can be possible unless the US rolls back its hostile policy towards the DPRK. Therefore, we will disregard such an attempt of the US in the future too. We make it clear that we won't give it such opportunities as in Singapore and Hanoi again. And she concluded, we already clarified that we will counter the US on the principle of power for power and goodwill for goodwill. Now, naturally, diplomacy, especially on the Korean Peninsula, is a complex dance. And Ms. Che's remarks earlier this month should not necessarily be taken as the DPRK's final word. It would be quite wrong, however, to regard, not to regard them as significant. Nor should her remarks be taken as a simple or absolute rejection of meetings and dialogue. In fact, in a careful reading of her statement, one can identify repeated expressions of a willingness to sit and talk under certain circumstances and conditions. But she nevertheless affirms that the DPRK is presently not interested, not simply in low-level exchanges with the US, 
but even in meetings of the Singapore and Hanoi type, which they apparently see as not geared towards a realistic and equitable agreement, but rather more for affording photo opportunities to the US. Of course, in the West, these meetings are habitually presented as affording the exact opposite opportunity. But it is important to appreciate how the other side sees things. You don't have to agree with them, but a failure to understand is, in my view, rarely useful. In asserting that meetings like those held in Singapore and Hanoi are no longer good enough, the DPRK has set the bar, or I would say its opening gambit, rather high. And it's pretty clear to me that the approaches from the Biden administration will be setting the bar rather low, both in terms of the level for any possible dialogue, at least at the first stages, and in terms of possible preconditions. So what we have apparently at the moment is a scissors gap uh, that needs to be narrowed. And in conclusion, I would say therefore that the current prospects for a diplomatic breakthrough do not seem very positive to me. This is therefore something for civil society also to ponder over and try to assess what can be done. The extensive and imaginative program currently being developed and rolled out around the world by our friends in the UPF will hopefully be able to make a significant and positive impact in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That was that was illuminating, uh, to say the least, uh, slightly pessimistic. Could I just nail down or is, it, is that the, the, the topic of this, what confidence building measures are necessary? You sort of outlaid the diplomatic choreography that's going on there. But if there was one thing that 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 America or anybody could deliver that would build confidence to, for talks to start, what would you say it was? That's, uh, that's a very interesting question. And if I could give an accurate answer, maybe things would be a lot, uh, a lot better all round. But I think, what, I think what the DPRK is always looking for and what's incredibly important to it is, is, is respect. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that really made the good mood music, particularly at the, at the Singapore um, uh, meeting was, was the attitude that Donald Trump displayed uh, toward, towards Kim Jong-un. I think they would need to have, I think assurance that there is to be um, a genuine and phased appro approach that is not going to be a take it or leave it unilateral demand from the United States that would um, that would be unacceptable for for them, and um, as they would see it, um, mar the dignity of their supreme leader, but also leave them no better off than, than they were in, in the past. So, I think that that Jenny's points were were interesting about some some sanctions relief uh, or an end to the bar on U.S. citizens vi visiting the DPRK, making it easier for. Um, uh, human, uh, humanitarian NGOs that the DPRK has built up quite a good constructive relationship with over past decades to, to do their work more freely. Uh, but a, a ba basically a commitment to an action for action uh, phased approach uh, based on mutual respect. Would you see, in, in the very long term, would you see that North Korea keeping its nuclear weapons, as Pakistan and India have said, sort of outside and then years of negotiation, giving them up like, say, Kazakhstan did and getting all the, the benefits from that, or continuing as a, a sort of rogue state uh, indefinitely with them? How, how do you see that unfolding? Well, I think it, it's hard to see the... Uh, I think it's hard to, to predict an, an exact final outcome. But I think that on, on the one hand, the, the DPRK has, of course, um, defined itself as, as a nuclear state in its constitution, uh, but the, the DPRK has shown itself capable of amending its constitution uh, <laughs> on, more, on more than one occasion. Uh, I think the uh, looking at it from, from the DPRK's point of view, the DPRK would see that it developed nuclear weapons because it because it felt threatened. Uh, if the threat, um, if they feel that that threat has gone away, then 
I think that the issue is, it is would would be on on the table, uh, but but the whole back and forth that we've seen going right back to to the early 1990s will obviously make people um, very, very nervous about that in Pyongyang, just as as they would see it, experience of Iraq and Libya and and, and so on also also makes them nervous. So I think there would have to be a lot of confidence and and trust building processes and. Um, and I think international guarantees that could somehow be nailed down in a way that they're not subject to the vagaries of the diplom of the democratic process in, yeah. in, 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 like, in like, the United States. Like the Iran States. thing, yeah, the, the yeah. way one minute you're in and the next you're yeah. out, depending on the election, yes. But, but I think yeah. it's clear in a way what the DPRK wants. It wants to be a, uh, accepted with diplomatic relations. Mm. It wants... Uh, it wants its economic develop. It wants its security guaranteed, and it wants its economic development facilitated. Okay, thank you for that uh, insight there. And we're now going on to uh, Aidan Foston Carter, a senior research fellow at Leeds University and a long-time observer of North Korea since 1968. I think he said in his. His, uh, some, one of his bios, and a contributing analyst to several BBC films that I made there when bureau chief in Beijing. So thank you for that, Aidan. Um, okay. He's followed events there for 49 years and therefore is well placed to explain why the trust is so difficult to build, uh, peace is so difficult to achieve. So Aidan, tell us why. Gosh, uh, I don't have that confidence in myself and nor should anybody else. If you follow North Korea for a long time, it means simply means that you have more chance to be more wrong about it in more ways, unless, of course, you're as consistent as Keith. Um, I, I hesitate to follow these two excellent speakers, uh, partly because I don't like what I'm going to say. That's a rather odd position to be in. Does anyone else find themselves like that? Let me first of all say thank you to UPF for organizing this timely event and for asking me to speak. But uh, to quote G.K. Chesterton, I tell you not for your comfort, and I'm going to stand back a bit from the immediacies that we've just heard, you know, very useful comments on from the two previous speakers and try and look at basically why we seem to be doing this over and over again, Groundhog Day, although I have another couple of metaphors for that. Um, I am by temperament an optimist, so to be pessimistic, which I'm going to be, is uh, goes against the grain. I hope others on this panel will tell me to cheer up and give me reasons to be cheerful, to quote the late great Ian Dury. Um, where are we in this on-off peace process? Heraclitus famously said that no one can step into the same river twice. He evidently never went to Korea. Uh, we seem to be stepping into the beginning of a peace process, a new beginning, another beginning over and over again with different administrations. We've had some reference to this. I shall come back to it also. Actually, you don't need to uh, go back to ancient Greece because the Koreans have a proverb for it too. And uh, sometimes it gets cited a lot. The first step is half the journey, Shijaki Banida. But it isn't. The first step is only the first step. We've seen that over and over again. More than once, the two Koreas have taken this first step towards peace, only for the second step not to come. And then sometimes one of the other side retreats even from that first step, duly blaming the other for it. Why does peace in Korea never get beyond first base? I think there are two main reasons, one on each side, actually a set of reasons, really. The first one is flagged up in the UPF's very useful background to this meeting, and it's come up in previous discussions. Uh, UPF said a president of the US or South Korea may withdraw from any prior agreements made by a previous administration. They can and they do, and it happens all the time. One or two examples. In the 1990s, Bill Clinton seemed to be getting somewhere with the agreed framework. Any other uh, people remember that or read it in the history books? Remember Kido? Remember the DPRK's enemies actually building it, a couple of nuclear power plants? So last century, those are other times which I think will not come back. Enter George W. Bush and pulls the plug. And yet the same Bush did decide later in his second term to engage Pyongyang after all, multilaterally in the six party talks. And he even took the DPRK off the US terrorist list. Japan wasn't very pleased about that. When it comes to U-turns, though, you can't really outdo Donald Trump, which has been mentioned. He began by insulting little rocket man and threatening fire and fury, only to launch into this unlikely and, to be frank, insubstantial bromance with Kim Jong-un. I mean, I don't, uh, picking up Keith's point, I don't uh, make light of the, uh, the atmospherics and all the glitter in Singapore, but he 
needed to be followed with substance and for reasons we can go into, it wasn't. Or for that matter, I go back a decade, the, uh, we, we know the American cases better probably than we know the South Korean cases. In 2008, a then newly elected South Korean president, Lee Myung-bak, reneged on joint projects which had been agreed by his predecessor, No Mu Hyun. I do think that was a fateful error. There are sort of if only the roads not taken in this, in this uh, long and winding road to, to not peace so far. If the two Koreas, I, I wrote this once in an article for the publication which Jenny edits, um, if, the t if only Lee Myung-bak hadn't done that, if the, the two Koreas would have started building win-win structures of an economic kind, of the kind that China and Taiwan more pragmatically over the years have managed between them, and while that doesn't resolve the political problem, it sure creates some shared interests, which people on either side might think twice before um, eliminated. But that didn't actually happen. So yes, we do ideally need bipartisanship on North Korea policy. We need it within countries when governments change and between allies, above all the US and the ROK, who quite often are not on quite the same page. But I, the trouble is, I don't really see how you do this. Um, there isn't really a consensus about how to handle North Korea. And there never will be, I think, for a number of reasons. One is ideology. Um, most conservatives in Seoul or Washington mistrust Pyongyang. Trump was different. Liberals tend to be readier to engage. But then there are interests. No two states are identically placed vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, not even allies, much less rivals. Um, yet last week in Seoul, the new US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, played a very old cracked record. I mean, among much else, he said, he urged Beijing to rein in Pyongyang. But it can't and it won't. And, and why should it? Uh, I wonder that the US doesn't learn this lesson. And anyway, there's, there's not really an agreement on, on what works with North Korea. Nothing much seems to work. Hawks blame doves, doves blame hawks. But does either have very much to show for all these years? North Korea is a tough nut. But what kind of a nut is it and why? Who might crack it and how? Not a metaphor that would go down well in Pyongyang, I suppose. Um, let's look at the Pyongyang side of the equation pretty briefly. I grant certainly that Western and other interlocutors have often messed up, mistakes uh, have, have, have been made. Um, policy, continuity and coordination are these perennial problems, uh, to my mind, insoluble, frankly. But it does take two to make peace, and somebody has to raise the question, does Pyongyang really want to? Sure, the DPRK has legitimate security concerns. Being put on an axis of evil, and the US then invades the number one on the list that it's made, doesn't exactly help to build trust or being urged to give up weapons of mass destruction following the excellent example of Libya, and then watching what happened to Muammar Gaddafi when he did that. Again, you, you can imagine the lessons drawn in Pyongyang. In spite of all that, as I read the last 30 years, or one could go back further, but 30 years of sort of quite active on and off peacemaking efforts, time and again, I don't see that Pyongyang has done its part. It hasn't reciprocated, it hasn't moved far or fast enough, or it's simply cheated. Time is short, so just briefly three examples. They cheated on the agreed framework by secretly starting a second nuclear program. Even during the sunshine years, they were developing nuclear weapons. That's not cheating, but it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make you wonder. Or right now, and I do want to emphasize this, and I'd love to hear an answer from somebody. Look how badly they're treating Moon Jae-in. Why? No South Korean president has ever or could have done more for the North. And none ever will again, you can be sure of that. But after feigning friendship through those three summits in 2018 and raising all our hopes, Kim Jong-un simply dumped Moon. For over two years, Kim and his sister have, been, have ignored or insulted Moon, and even famously, childishly blew up the joint liaison office, just to show we're really, really angry. Why? How do we explain this? I, I, the only explanation that makes sense to me is that Kim used Moon to get to Trump, which is what he really wanted, and then he junked him. Is Kim angry at the Hanoi summit debacle? No doubt, but that wasn't Moon's fault. If Kim was wiser, or if he really cared about peace on the peninsula, he could have still made nice with Seoul, in fact, subtly splitting Seoul away from Washington. Family reunions, for example, could have happened. No problem with sanctions for those. Or Kim could have accepted Moon's offers still being made of aid for flood damage or for COVID, which, of course, they say they don't have. He sure could use that help, but his people would be grateful, even if Kim isn't. But there's no dice, there's no deal, there's nothing doing, and I frankly find that very puzzling. Pyongyang used to play off rival powers against each other quite skillfully, but Kim has rebuffed Seoul, and that means he's only got Beijing left. He's probably right that Xi Jinping will fight his corner, but Xi Jinping may also make demands. That's a bigger issue, I guess. So, having followed North Korea all these many years, very often being wrong, and I hope I'm wrong this time, 
many ups and downs. I, I honestly if, can't say that this is a regime that is trying hard for peace. I think North Korea chose its path and its outsider status long ago. I call it militant mendicancy, simultaneously a beggar and a mugger, threatening and milking the wider world. Do I sound cynical? They're robbing banks these days. Of course, you don't actually have to do it with guns anymore. You do it online. Uh, see the latest US indictments and the forthcoming UN panel of experts. Um, so this is the kind of state it is. So I fear the prospects are bleak. Of course, once COVID is over, all the familiar intermediaries, countries, organizations, individuals will resume their regular visits to Pyongyang. I applaud the zeal of those who do this. I feel terribly bad carping, but honestly, at what point do you admit it's a mug's game and they're stringing us along? This regime is what it is. It does what it does by its own free choice. You want to be a peacemaker? Then Pyongyang may humor you if it sees gain in it. But don't imagine, even for a second, that what you seek is what they seek. Now, I really hate to be negative, but this is what my head tells me. My heart has always wanted peace and indeed unification. How about that in Korea? Please convince me otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan, for that, that rather, well, not worrying analysis. Just, uh, just in a nutshell, uh, could you answer the question in a couple of words if it is, who can guide the process? This next time round, this deja vu, this Groundhog Day, who should guide the process? I slightly lost what you said, but I'm consistent with the, with the gloom I've just uh, reluctantly spread. Um, there is no one person who can do that. Given that the North Korea really only cares about the US, I think that's apparent from their behavior, then if so, so those in the Moon administration, which only has a year left anyway, who think it's them, I fear they are wrong. Um, and I think a lot hinges, as, as indeed we've heard from the two previous speakers, uh, you know, both, I think, extremely well informed about respective governments, uh, that it has to be on that side. But whether, you know, whether it's, I think, well, well, the US is all important for the North Korea, whether the reverse is true, but Biden has quite a bit else to do. Um, I, I really, I really not sure. OK, up, up in the air at the moment. So we're going to move to one of the great experts on North Korea, to Mike Chinoy. Um, and, and please put in your questions, your challenge the panel, challenge me, challenge, challenge UPF, uh, comment on the debate, because after Mike, we're going to move to questions and answers. And Mike Chinoy's groundbreaking work on North Korea, I believe, Mike, won you meetings with both Kim Il-sung and President Clinton, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, and Mike is currently senior fellow at the US-China Institute at the University of Southern California. His books include Meltdown, the inside story of the North Korean nuclear crisis, on which we have a question as about where do they get their money from, which we'll come to in a minute. But this is, a, and, and then your, your latest book, which is a topic that I want to get into now, Are You With Me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement, which is about human rights. Uh, it, 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 it begins Northern Ireland, but it's about human rights around the world. It should be read by anybody interested in that topic. And one of the issues I've asked Mike to address is, should peace or trust or whatever ever evolve on the Korean Peninsula, how is this issue of human rights going to be dealt with? Because there's mass violations there, there will have to be some sort of accountability. How is that going to happen? So Mike, please give us your insight on that and any of your experience and analysis on the whole situation. Well, thanks very much, Humphrey, and thanks to UPF and, and to Robin for arranging this event uh, and inviting me. Um, I should just uh, agree with Aidan about uh, that this is a very confusing topic, North Korea in general. And I recall leaving Pyongyang after one of the many trips I made when I was a correspondent for CNN. And my producer turned to me and said, I am still confused, but at a higher level. Uh, and, and sometimes I feel all this discussion will leave us, I hope, uh, uh, confused, but, but at a somewhat higher level because it is an exceptionally complicated issue. And human rights is a particularly a uh, difficult issue, and uh, uh, down the road, in terms of of, of, of a you know a transition to peace, it's very hard to envision. But in the current situation, it's still a very live issue. Uh, there's no question that the human rights situation inside North 
Korea is very grim, as many different reports and eyewitness accounts have shown over the years. But acknowledging this as an important issue and then thinking through what, if anything, might actually produce concrete improvements are two different things. President Biden has made clear that human rights is going to be a much bigger priority for the US government uh, around the world than it was under President Trump and Secretary of State Blinken uh, mentioned human rights during his recent trip uh, to Northeast Asia. But I think it's very clear that simply calling out the North Koreans on human rights isn't going to produce any change. Indeed, history shows uh, that when North Korean leaders are pressured on this and on other issues, they tend to react by doubling down or pushing back. Pressure or sanctions might hurt North Korea, but there's very little evidence to show that it has ever produced a change in North Korean behavior of the kind that the international community has wanted to see. Uh, that's certainly the case uh, in, in relation to human rights. And that's especially true uh, given the nature of the North Korean state, where the leader is uh, essentially revered like a god and the state propaganda generally talks about uh, what a wonderful place North Korea is. Uh, so publicly uh, belittling them or laying out all the many ways that human rights are violated in North Korea, although I think it's important in terms of there being a historical record, it's not likely to lead to any meaningful improvement for the citizens of North Korea. Yet it's not impossible to conceive of ways uh, in which uh, a human rights dialogue with North Korea could get underway. Uh, Humphrey referred to my new book, Are You With Me, Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement. And one example is to look at, how, at Boyle, who was a founder and leader of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, and then later became one of the world's foremost human rights lawyers, approached human rights in his own dealings with China. Uh, in 2008, he visited Beijing and gave a series of talks to think tanks and universities on human rights. But the focus was not on denouncing China. Instead, he used the talks to explain how the human rights system at the United Nations worked. He explained the various international human rights treaties and covenants. He talked about the link between development, security, and human rights. And he laid out a more expansive definition of human rights, such as the right to health, the right to education, uh, which was somewhat closer to the Chinese definition. When it seemed appropriate in these conversations, he also raised the issue of freedom of the press, freedom of expression, freedom of association, but not front and center, not in your face, and not as a vehicle for him as an outsider to come across as denouncing the Chinese system. And he got a, a surprisingly warm uh, response. So I, I mention this because something similar, although perhaps even more cautious, might offer an initial opening for conversations with North Korea. North Korea is a signatory to the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's made international commitments to refrain from discriminating against the disabled. Various NGOs have worked on helping disabled people in North Korea. So that might be an entry point where you could actually have a conversation with North Korea uh, with the hope of perhaps eventually expanding uh, the range of topics. Um, but it's also worth pointing out at the moment, there's no diplomatic process between the US and North Korea, as the other speakers have noted. There are layers of suspicion and distrust and ill will. So in my view, adding human rights as an immediate item on the uh, any prospective agenda is likely to go nowhere. But if, for example, the US and North Korea can somehow begin a more sustained process of diplomatic engagement. And in the course of moving towards what might lead to eventually a meaningful improvement in relations, maybe even at some point down the road, uh, the establishment of liaison offices, really trying to break down all this ill will, then human rights certainly belongs on the agenda. And under those kinds of circumstances, it's not impossible to envision some progress. One other point about human rights. Um, there is certainly an argument to be made that economic development itself helps expand the rights of citizens. Uh, that's especially true in turn, if you look at, at Vietnam or the experience of, of, of China, where uh, in terms of people acquiring greater uh, personal as opposed to political freedom, 
greater choices in terms of lifestyle, work, marriage, residence, travel, and so on. Um, you know, if you compare China now, even with the tightening under Xi Jinping in recent years, to the China that I saw when I first visited in 1973, it's like night and day. So to me, what that means is that if North Korea's economy uh, survives this period of COVID isolation and, and begins to develop and modernize, and it's clear, I think, that that's still a central goal for Kim Jong-un to fix the economy and improve people's living standards. If there's more foreign, foreign trade, if there's more investment, there's more contact, there are more exchanges, that over time, inexorably, that will lead to some greater opening and more personal choices for, for ordinary people. Uh, so I think you have to see human rights as a very incremental process that banging on now about how terrible it is uh, may be objectively true, but it does nothing to improve conditions for the people who are living there and only adds another obstacle uh, to the process of breaking down all the, the distrust and ill will. Um, let me just say a couple of things on the diplomatic front. It seems we are in danger of overlooking one critical point, that North Korea since 2017 has maintained its moratorium on nuclear tests and long-range missile tests. And for Kim Jong-un, that was a really big concession. And I think it's fair to say that in North Korean eyes, the U.S. has so far not come up with a comparable concession. And when the signals we're seeing now from the North Koreans are not that it's impossible to have dialogue or diplomacy with the United States, but the ball's in Washington's court and the North is, is looking for a big gesture. For example, reiterating what Secretary of State Pompeo said about American uh, goal of achieving a fundamentally different strategic relationship between our two countries or reaffirming the Singapore communique. Um, when the North concludes, if the North concludes that's not on the cards, then I think we'll begin to see a cycle of further escalation and provocation as it moves ahead doing all the things that it's held off doing, and then we'll really be in trouble. But the door is not yet shut, and we're early in the Biden administration, so it's not impossible that this dynamic is, is, is going to uh, could unfold in a, in, a, in a different, slightly more constructive way. But I have to say, having watched this for a long time, I'm not optimistic either. Mike, uh, th thank you. It, it, am I right in the way reading this is that is that counterintuitively, we could actually get confidence building measures by using these various UN fora to discuss human rights and development and all that and starting dialogue in, in these areas. That's a reality whilst the concentration camps and all those atrocities continue. You could certainly talk about it. I, th I think you know, the, the, we have to keep sight of the bigger picture here. The North Korean strategic goal, going back to the early 90s and, and Kim Il-sung, has been to have a fundamentally different relationship with the United States. And I think that still holds true. People talk about how close North Korea and China are, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, deep down, uh, Kim Jong-un is not happy with that. It's not in North Korea's strategic interest to be so dependent on China. Uh, but he doesn't want to come across as appearing weak or, or um, you know, pleading. Uh, he wants to do it on his terms. Um, but I think if, if, a, if a diplomatic dynamic gets going, you can have those conversations. But absent the diplomatic dynamic, I don't think that, that those conversations are likely or would produce anything. Um, we're opening up, and I want to stick with you, 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 Mike, for the moment. We're opening up to the questions now, and there's one from Keith Best, and in your expertise in your book Meltdown, the inside story of the North Korea nuclear crisis, uh, Keith Best say, asks, continued development of both nuclear and conventional weapons is not cheap against the financial impoverishment of North Korea. Where is the money coming from? Can you help us with that? Well, I think, I think Partly, the money is coming from from the fact that that's a higher priority than uh, improving living standards. Uh, and and uh, if you have to make choices about where you put your resources, uh, it's clear that North Korea would rather invest in the in the technology needed 
uh, to develop an extremely sophisticated nuclear and missile program rather than invest in, in lifting its people uh, from poverty. There is a long track record that the North Koreans have of so-called illicit activities, uh, arms deals, and all kinds of other uh, shady business. Uh, I think you made a reference to the fact that there was a, a cyber crime, getting money from banks and so on. Uh, a lot of unsavory things, but if a state makes it as a priority that that's where the resources go and it doesn't, and if, if, if people have to suffer, well, people have to suffer. Um, and it's not alone in that mentality. I remember when the Pakistanis developed their bomb being in Pakistan yeah. and people, we'll eat grass so that we can have a nuke. So, so it's not are, are they, so, sorry, mindset. Are, are they getting money from China or Russia or Pakistan or anybody, or is it just in, in the mix of its economy? I would be surprised if they were, but I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think it's much more prioritizing what resources they have and, and acquiring them wherever they can get it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a, a, a question here, which I'd like to put to Keith. Um, if uh, Keith, if you're still with us. Um, I am. Yeah. How does the DPRK see us? I presume that's the West calling them a rogue state. Uh, is this part of showing our antagonistic view of the country. This is from Nick Bic Bicall. Um, short answer on that, Keith? Well, obviously the DPRK doesn't regard itself um, uh, as a rogue state. Um, I think that in, in, the, in the North Korean uh, mentality, I, I think they would put the epithet back on the United States um, go, going back to, to, to the Korean War, the bombing of North Korea, um, uh, and, and, and so on. And I think they would uh, define this as part of the, um, of the hostile, what they call the hostile policy, which they always demand uh, the United States dispense with if there's, if there's to make progress. Uh, for myself, I'd say that probably this kind of name calling actually doesn't really help to, to, to move the situation uh, yeah. forward. And, and I you know, pretty much uh, agree with what Mike said about the human rights situation that uh, uh, when the, as we've seen in China and Vietnam, uh, although there's of course huge focus on human rights in China at the moment, but uh, what we've seen in China and Vietnam is, is that in terms of the real life choices of real people, uh, have been transformed out of all recognition by, by, by economic development. Uh, and uh, I think one, that one has to look at engagement like that. Okay, there's, um, th thank you, Keith. There's a, 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 there's a few questions on China, which I'm gonna uh, put together and, and bring to, to Jenny in a second, but I'd like to bring this one to, um, to Aidan. Uh, it, it's about, it seems European nations or the EU could decide to take a more respectful and neutral role, creating communications and cooperation with the UK outside of the nuclear issue. What is it kind of project could put the North Korea on more equal terms and build genuine trust? I'd like Aidan to answer this because of your general Groundhog Day <laughs> view of the whole process. Any chance of that happening? <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, will you be anyone be surprised if I say no? Alas, I don't think so. I mean, the trouble is, it's uh, one thing about Groundhog Day is almost anything that anyone suggests now, one answer is been there, done that, didn't work last time. The EU taking a role, does anyone remember back in the days of George W. Bush? Um, I mean, for all that the EU, obviously most countries are members of NATO, are in an alliance with the US and all voted for if they were on the Security Council, as the UK is, um, the various UN resolutions and so on. Um, and now being anachronistic, as most of those resolutions haven't happened, so bracket that. But anyway, the EU, the Chris Patton, the Troika visit, who else? You know, there was a big high level EU, uh, EU visit when, again, a sort of deja vu, when Kim, Kim Jong un's father, Kim Jong il, had his great coming out party. He too was the guy we'd never seen, we'd never heard of, and then suddenly he appears on the scene in 2000. And so it, there have been efforts at this, but I don't think the EU is, I mean, sometimes I think, you know, somebody should try to act independently. I don't think the EU is going to, in fact, it's, it's, you know, it's got its own various sanctions too. And when Moon Jae-in 
as the South Korean president uh, went on a tour of a number of European countries, including the Vatican, two years ago, I think, two, three years ago, rather hoping for something like this. Um, I don't think he got any joy. Yes, so, and, and the no. EU's got its, it's having its vaccine wars at the moment anyway, so I suspect it doesn't have the bandwidth to to deal with that. And Nick comes, Nick Bikal comes back with actually quite a good point. The North Korea does not have the money to create a war. Why are the US and other nations so worried about it, which is a, a, which is a, a fair point, which uh, if I could spin that and onto Jenny Couple with, I'm gonna lump these China questions together. Had, uh, how pivotal is China to this? How much has it been helping them? How much is North Korea a sort of proxy tap? It can turn on and off. Um, and, and therefore, does it become wrapped up again, I think, as we talked, discussed at the beginning in this whole Indo-Pacific US-China uh, situation? Well, I, I think people really overestimate the, the China-North Korea relationship and the influence that China has. And yes, North Korea is largely economically dependent on China. That is their largest trade partner um, and economic influence is can be useful, um, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee political influence. And what we've seen over the years is there's deep mistrust between the Chinese and the North Koreans that they will, you know, tap into and tap out of whenever it suits them. And, and this goes back to, you know, centuries of, of China-Korea relations over the years. Um, but what happens is that, you know, North Korea is constantly looking for ways to reduce its dependence on China, um, but it will use China and use China's goodwill, knowing that China really values stability in the region above all else. Um, whenever it, it suits them in a time like this, when the US and, and China are at odds and have a very um, strategic rivalry is really intensified. These are moments when North Korea will try to stay on China's good side longer because there's greater benefits for them in, in really exploiting those cleavages. But when the US and China are actually cooperating like what we saw in 2017, we also saw that North Korea had no problem defying China. Whatever China wanted, it didn't really matter. North Korea was going to do what it wanted anyway. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that China can help immensely in this just because they have economic influence really also um, misunderstands how North Korea perceives China and the US because really the US is the enemy, China is not. <laughs> there's only so much that China can do along those lines and there's only so much that's within China's interest to do along those lines where you know the US really has the power to do stuff if they really had the will to do it. And, and, and just before I, I'm going to finish up with a, a round the whole panel, but just for, at Nick's point, um, they couldn't win a war, they couldn't afford a war. So why are we all so worried? Well, that that is also, you know, a big question, right? Like, would they, I don't think there's a lot of belief that they would actually start a war that they couldn't win. Um, but the question is, is that the more capabilities that they have, the more it threatens, the more it questions um, that strategic relationship and, and the balance of power. So it, especially for South Korea and Japan. And like I said, as they build the, the long range technologies, uh, missile technologies, it also calls into question extended deterrence. So if you're South Korea, um, you have a much bigger belief that some kind of conflict is possible and you're closest to it. And you have you know declining belief as North Korea's long range missile capabilities grow of the US's willingness to come in um, and you know this trade off of would we defend uh, Seoul over LA right so you know this is the it's more a strategic balance and balance of power in the in the whole deterrent circle rather than really believing that North Korea is going to attack at some point Okay. There's a was a comment here which you, we haven't got time for the question, but is it how far is the global community, particularly the Western world, responsible for making DPRK feel dismayed and insecure? And I guess raising from that is is that insecurity enough to have concentration camps and nuclear weapons and all the rest of it? I just want to go through. There's one from Alan Richard here, which I think is a good one. If everybody can give a two second answer to it. Uh, um, starting with you, Jenny, um, how stable is Kim's family? How stable is the regime in North Korea? Jenny? 
Well, from all the signs that we've seen, they're, they're pretty stable. Um, and, you know, certainly the relationship between Kim Jong-un and his sister is quite good. I think they do have a contingency plan if something happens with Kim Jong-un's health in the near term. But we, we see a, a big consolidation of power and not a lot of rivalry to that. Okay, thank you. Keith, uh, is the regime stable? Well, I'm always slightly um, surprised at how how much it's often taken as a given in the West that the regime in, is unstable because uh, any place that has had three leaders since 1945 in most parts of the world will be considered um, will be considered fairly stable. Um, I, I think what what's uh, I think. We haven't got time to go into this, but I think there's some very interesting, shall we say, personality differences between Kim Jong Un and his his father. That uh, we we see a, a return to a much more hands-on style of leadership, a, a much more engaged style of, of, of leadership, pub public speeches, and 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 so on. And you, we, we've seen it with the the different titles that the changes in titles that that Kim Jong Un has has been has been acquiring that he seems to grow you know more and more confident um, in in his um, in his own leadership system. Okay, okay. thank thank you. And uh, Aidan, would the collapse of uh, of the regime and the Kim family alleviate your pessimism? Um, not necessarily, because. There might be chaos, there might be loose nukes, but what I feel I have to say is this is one of the many ways that I've been wrong about North Korea in the past. I was a very long time collapsist and I was far from alone in this. I think a lot of us after the events of 1989, 1991 in Europe, um, or for that matter, where communist rule collapsed, uh, it would be fair to say, or for that matter, the, the equally dramatic economic transformation of China and uh, Vietnam, under communist rule into very different kinds of economies. The North, North Korea just seemed like a, a sort of fierce little dinosaur in a world of mammals. And how could it possibly uh, survive? I was wrong. I th the world is becoming more like North Korea, don't you think? What with MAGA, what with Brexit, which is sort of your English juche and equally oh, nonsensical. Now, 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 now you're going to bring <laughs> us all down. So I'm going to move on to, okay. <laughs> move on to Mike, Mike Chinoy. Mike, uh, it, it, it's, a, it, it's not as if the regime is stable. We, we've had an answer that. What are the stakes? If, if it collapses, if, if so, something, what are the stakes uh, for us all if, if the regime goes wrong? Well, if North Korea collapsed, as, as Aidan mentioned, there's a danger of chaos, there's a danger of loose nukes, there's a danger that it could be uh, worse in many ways. But I'm, in, I'm of the school that I think North Korea has, North Korea's resiliency has been consistently underestimated. I remember back in the day working for CNN, living in Beijing, uh, when uh, what, people were constantly speculating and what would happen when Kim Il-sung died. And then he did die. And I was the first American to go to North Korea after he died two weeks later. And there was all the speculation that Kim Jong-il is, is, is unprepared. He's inexperienced. He's not going to last six months. And I came away from that trip convinced that was not the case. And people laughed at me course, he lasted till 2011. And when he died and Kim Jong-un took over, Victor Cha, a very distinguished North Korea analyst who was at one point going to be uh, 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 Donald Trump's ambassador to South Korea until he fell out with Trump, uh, wrote that Kim Jong-un wasn't going to last six months. Well, here we are in 2021. So I think people, just because it's weird and idiosyncratic and has a lot of aspects that a lot of people don't like or find uh, off-putting or scary or uh, horrible, doesn't automatically mean it's it's going to end up on the dustbin of history. And I think people who predicate policy based on that are making a big mistake. It's a reality. It's here. And it has to be dealt with uh, as a reality uh, until there's compelling evidence that it's not going to stay. And I don't see any sign of that at this point. Thank you for that. And, and now, and thank you, everybody. We're, we're going to have closing remarks from Dr. Katsumi Utsuka. Uh, Universal Peace Federation's Europe and Middle East chairman, and among he's in Tokyo, uh, not in the Middle East or in uh, or in Europe. But so so welcome. But uh, one 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 thing that I should mention is that amongst his many things, uh, uh, he's he's worked with Korean communities in Japan from both the north and the south. 
creating a dialogue between them. And he's going to return us to the original uh, uh, title of this, the confidence building measures and guiding the process and trust. So Dr. Katsumi Otsuka, over to you. Thank you very much for introducing me so nicely. It is my pleasure to greet you from Tokyo where the cherry blossoms are blooming. Looking back the past history of Korea, because of the geopolitical location, Korean people has experienced tremendous difficulties. Their domestic conflict also has been very serious for a long time. Since Korean War gave unimaginable damages to the land and people, this desire for peace and stability is very strong. It looks to me, however, there is no political leader in Korea who has a clear vision for peaceful unification. Regarding the relationship between South and North, as you know well, it is very difficult even to start a dialogue for peace. How can, how can we open the door of North Korea wider? How can we bring them on the discussion table? There is nobody, I think, who has won the trust of North Korean leader at present. Since I have been in charge of the Japan Korea Undersea Tunnel Construction Project proposed by Reverend Dr. Sam Byung Moon, in 1981, allow, allow me to speak briefly about this project. This project suddenly become one of the big controversies in the city mayor election in coming April in the second largest city of Busan, South Korea, from where under Sitonger goes towards Japan. The conservative camp has been appealing that the project will help economic development in both, both nations. On the other hand, the liberal camp is accusing them, saying that the conservative party is overly pro-Japan. There are still lingering anxiety among the Korean people to have a closer connection with Japan. That is why two countries must create a tunnel of heart first for realizing the physical connection. I hope that the project will make to reverse the mistrust between two countries. The idea of the undersea tunnel is not an impossible dream, but a realistic idea, I think. I heard that it was once believed in Europe to construct a tunnel in the Dover Strait was impossible to build, financially impractical, but resulted in numerous positive changes to both UK and mainland Europe. I think that Korea and Japan must learn a lot from the UK and Europe. As for the South Korean general climate, I'm deeply concerned in the recent South Korean survey, which shows that the hope for unification has been diminishing among young people. This is why the new measure with which Korean people will be inspired has to be taken. UPF Korea hopes to take that role. It is also necessary to think about the enormous cost of the unification. There is no doubt that the Korea alone cannot cover the cost of unification. It is also needed to let neighboring countries know that the unified Korea will not be a threat to any nations. It must be understood that the North Korean missile range covers not only Japan and the USA, but also China and Russia. I think there is a way for these countries to work together. Under these circumstances, the UPF founders have been created various peace movements, not only for the Korean Peninsula, but also for the world peace. What motivated Dr. and Mrs. Moon to keep working for peace? Both of UPF founders were born in what is now North Korea during the four, its 40 years occupation by Japan. They experienced the Second World War and the Korean War. They were both refugees during the Korean War. This is one of the factors that have motivated them to work tirelessly, tirelessly for peace and unification through dialogue. This year, 2021, marks the 30 years anniversary of their dramatic visit to Pyongyang, North Korea, and meeting with Kim Il-sung, who attempted to kill Dr. Moon in the prison camp. The steps for unification by fiscal force was over and should not happen again. The steps for the unification by competition I can say has finished by winning of South Korea, but the way to the unification is still very far away. Now is the time therefore to pursue the unification by a third way with new idea. That is a proposal of the headwind sword by Dr. Moon. The headwind sword vision is not an idea to destroy the opponent, 
but the thought to embrace even enemies, create a new identity and mutual respect. Let me speak a little bit about uh, Asian tradition. Since we have the Confucius tradition in common to bo in both the, uh, democratic and non-democratic nations in the East Asia, we may be able to make common base for creating deeper exchanges to strengthen the cultural ties even while sanctions are in place is another good option to open the nation of North Korea. Good example is the Little Angels in May, 1998. That the Little Angels, the world famous girl singing and dancing troops established by the UP founders in the early 1960s, visited Pyongyang to show their performance there. A similar group from the DPRK visited the city of Seoul in return. This was a splendid cultural exchange for both. Dr. Moon once sent his invoice to the North Korean, advising them to give respect to all they met, saying, you must give your advisory, advisory uh, the respect and dignity. You, in your bias, may not think that they don't, they deserve. In the long term, it is worth it. You can change your enemies into a partner. The East Asian situation, including the peninsula, has become an international concern. European countries have also shown their concern to the peace of East Asia. I think time has come for us to proceed one step ahead for the peaceful unification of Korean Peninsula, mobilizing all experiences and wisdom from all over the world. I'm sure that the European experiences will surely work well for the stability of the East Asia and for the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula. John Lennon, the member of the Beatles said, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. I'm very happy that I can dream together with you, expressing my gratitude again for inviting me to this webinar and for also for your participation to this webinar. I'd like to end my greetings to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katsumi Utsaku, Ots Otsuka. Sorry. Um, I just had one, one question to carry on from that because we said, who can guide the process? Will UPF be central to that, do you think? That's what, I, what we are hoping to do so. We, we just wish to be a guru to connect two countries. The same as that uh, Reverend Moon, uh, Dr. Moon did. 30 years ago in Pyongyang, risking his life. Mr. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Moon visited Pyongyang. And now the Mrs. Moon is wishing to visit North Korea once again, to be a group, good group for both countries. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Aya. Thank you. And thank you everybody out there, wherever you are in the world um, watching this webinar. And thank you to the panel. Uh, to Keith Bennett, Aidan Foster Carter, Mike Chinoy, uh, and Jenny Town. Uh, much appreciated for your insight into all of that. Thank you, the Universal Peace uh, Federation, for this that uh, might be central to the process of any uh, confidence building measures, which is what we debated. And goodbye uh, to the panel, uh, goodbye to the audience, and thank you very much.